Yeah, hello. Uh, my name is Leila. I'm from Freiburg. And our first session will be about new Galaxy features. And first up is Marius talking about the workflow editor. Where is he? Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, big honor to do the first of the regular scheduled talks. So, well, nice that you all made it. Um, yeah, uh, as Leila said, I'm going to talk about a few different things. Um, that were happening with regards to workflows in Galaxy in general. And I think the major thing we've worked on um, yeah, during the last year, uh, and actually the last couple of years, is to make workflows more reasonable. Um, and that often meant to make them more flexible so that are not, you know, that you don't have to go copy paste your workflow around or like edit it uh, on the go, so that you really have a a set workflow, high quality workflow that you can use and use everywhere, share with your colleagues and maybe say, hey, actually running a workflow is much easier than running a tool. So um, yeah, I mean, a brief, brief, super brief history of workflows in Galaxy. So uh, workflows were available since at least 2008. I, that's before I joined the community. And um, I've seen on my visit at Penn State that there was even a nice cool t-shirt that was all about the workflow editor noodles. Um, I was a great t-shirt. Um, yeah, and I mean, since then it has evolved to meet the community demands. Uh, data sets have grown, um, not just in size, but also in number. Um, and like, if you look back, we've really come a long way, uh, but that doesn't mean there aren't uh, great ideas that we can still pursue. Um, personally, I think this is the fastest and most reliable way to do analysis because I think my like second experience in Galaxy was like, wow, I found this really cool thing, uh, but I actually just chose the wrong input data set. And that's something that doesn't really happen in a workflow where you chained up everything. So, you know, it's, it's very reproducible as opposed to like manually doing something. It's whatever you do in Galaxy, it's, it's quite reproducible, but it doesn't help you if you did the wrong thing. Um, yeah, so it's also reliable because like with everything, we record every parameter every step of the way. Um, so you can go back and say, well, that's a weird result. And then you, you see, oh, I did the wrong thing. That's exactly what, what happened to me um, in my early days. Um, and I wanna say that, you know, running a workflow should really be easier than running a tool. Um, well, about the state of workflows in, in Galaxy, uh, in general, I mean, there's really broad spectrum of like how refined the workflows are. Um, and it sort of goes from like an analysis that you did in your history and you generated the workflow, which is super cool, right? I mean, it's, it's a workflow. You just, you went along, you did your analysis, it looked good. Uh, you deleted the stuff you don't need anymore. You extract the workflow and that's amazing, but it's only going to work if you have the exact same set of data sets uh, that you used. So, you know, if you just want to change the, the reference genome or you have a bunch more data sets, that's likely not going to work right away, but it's a great start. Um, and then, you know, let's call it, you, you refine it a little bit and I get into it um, also in the, in the workflow training later today. You can, you can tweak them some, um, you can add test data, uh, you can submit it to a repository and then you have some really high quality workflows that um, ideally should be used uh, widely, and then really sharing is caring. So you can uh, you can submit uh, workflows to uh, the GA4 GAH TRS servers. So that would be Workflow Hub and Doc Store, and then inside Galaxy you can discover these workflows and install them and run them um, at the click of a button. Um, so another thing that I think is important to remember is that creating workflow requires scientific domain knowledge and a bit of trial and error. Um, I think that that's always in, involved and at the very minimum, you gotta check <laughs> did this work actually create what I think it should have created. Um, and it requires some knowledge of Galaxy concepts and uh, the more powerful your workflow, the more concepts you need to be aware of. Um, but running a workflow should only require domain knowledge, right? Um, I think that ties in also with the first talk that um, we want to make it as easy as possible. And I think there is a gradient of skill from workflow author to workflow user. And uh, at, at least in terms of computational knowledge. 
So really, if you create a workflow, you should be able to hand that off to a student and just say, these are the input data sets. That's what you need to be careful about and make sure like the result looks good. Um, and you know, you can always drill deeper, but like just running, it should be the easiest part. And because all the parameters are set, it should be easier than running a workflow, a, a tool, which oftentimes we introduce users to Galaxy by saying you can run a tool on your data set, but maybe we should say, hey, start with a workflow. If you need more details, you can always go back to the tool level. Um, anyway, and then, yeah, something that's important to users is, of course, also to make it easy to find the workflows, to run the workflows, to track what the workflows are currently doing, and to archive them, because you also don't want to keep them around forever. And I think it's also important to create high quality artifacts for people that just don't want to look at Galaxy, like your bioinformatician colleagues um, may prefer to like, you know, you use Vim, use Nano to, to explore everything. And they're not going to be super happy with an archive of Galaxy. Um, yeah, so I mean, in the broad sense, that's the direction uh, we want to go into. And now I'm just going to show you some cool new things that happened during the last year. Um, I went around saying it's not a rewrite, but in the end, it, it's definitely at least a partial uh, rewrite of the workflow editor. And we've made it completely reactive. And so what you see here is that um, uh, I'm writing some stuff here um, on the top. And you see that uh, the data, this is, a, this is a, the internal state of the Galaxy workflow and corresponds more or less to what you would download. This is not exposed in the user interface currently. It's just something I used for development to make sure that you know, when I do things, it really reacts in, in real time that we didn't miss something. Maybe if you've used the editor extensively, you, you've noticed in the past that sometimes you did something, you saved it and you reload it and it, didn't, it wasn't actually that. So that's an easy visual way to confirm and show that uh, things are really reactive. What you do really applies. Um, another thing that um, if you're a long-time user have probably noticed, um, if you take a workflow and you upgrade a tool and the tool has gained an output or has maybe lost an output, uh, that connection would just disappear and you wouldn't even know. Um, that's not great. Um, and instead, we're highlighting in red the things that aren't present anymore. And in orange, we have the connections that, um, you know, you, you got to do something about it if you want to run the workflow. Uh, so that makes it a whole lot easier. Um, yeah, we've really improved the panning and zooming. Um, that's work that, uh, I mean, I, I started it. I didn't do a great job. Then Lila came in and like made it really awesome. Um, and it works with the mouse, uh, it works with the keyboard, it works also with a touch screen. So this I recorded on my phone. Um, I mean, just playing around with it. I mean, it's really, really cool. Uh, we have improved keyboard navigation. Um, so with a tap key, you can uh, jump along uh, spots, um, the steps in your workflow. With the shift tab, you can go to your previous uh, step. And then um, you have a little outline what is currently active. <clears throat> if you hit space, you do the action. So if you're on an output node, like up there, you hit space, um, a small menu opens, and it will give you the available actions there. So that can either be connect to a compatible step or disconnect from a connected step. Um, and like in huge workflows, that can actually be easier than dragging the mouse all the way to your next input, because it just gives you what's possible. Um, uh, the switching between steps is much snappier. Um, so it used to be that once you activate a step, this is the tool form. Um, if you've opened a Galaxy tool before, this is the same thing that you have when you open a normal tool. Um, and all of the state is defined in the backend. Um, so we had to make a request to open it. Um, and now we don't because all the data is already encoded in the workflow. Uh, so it feels much faster. It feels much nicer. Um, Lila added another thing that has been requested many times, which is to, like, you can, you can add tags to outputs. Personally, I don't think you should. You should use connections, but it's a different topic. Come, come to the training. Come to my TED Talk. I'll tell you why you shouldn't use tags. But for, 
for some purposes for others. It's great, but um, whatever. So you can add your tag um, and it will be displayed right here on the node. So if you wanna know where a tag got added or removed, you can now go see that without clicking through each and every step. Um, this is something that's maybe geared towards power users, but uh, you may know that um, when you create a workflow, uh, not only can you include tools, you can also include other workflows. So those are sub workflows. And um, you know, your 20 step workflow, um, each of your 20 steps has maybe two or three outputs. You don't wanna see all of them as options for your next analysis. So what we um, did is that only um, outputs that are marked as a workflow output. So it's not just that it's produced, it means like this is like a, an important artifact of the workflow. This is a workflow output. Uh, so you can select these workflow outputs with a button, uh, with, with a check mark. We used to um, only have, uh, I, I think we only had the checkbox. Um, and that would also control whether or not the output is visible in the history which works well if you're not using sub workflows. But if you have a sub workflow, uh, you may want to show outputs that are not important for your sub workflow and vice versa. Um, you may wanna have um, output from a workflow that doesn't interest the user at all and shouldn't be visible in the history. So the separation, it's something simple, but um, it makes creating like workflows that reuse other workflows um, much easier and yeah, I mean, it, it's a, it looks small, but it's, it's a big deal. Um, we got an infinite grid again, uh, great work from, uh, Leila. It used to be possible if, when you create a workflow with 200, 300 steps that the little grid, I mean, you know, it's probably not visible to you. I can barely see it. Um, but it used to be that you could like move your workflow out of the grid. Um, and now she did some magic and a, it's an infinite grid and you have some larger grid lines. I hope you can see it. Um, so you have the smaller grid lines and the, the larger grid lines. So if you were using plotting paper in, in school, I mean, it looks a bit like that. Um, we have something else that is, again, doesn't seem like a big deal, but really, really cool again. It's an idea that uh, later started in, in the tool form, and it also makes a lot of sense in the workflow editor um, to make the distinction between an optional input and a required input. Uh, so some tools can take like optional data sets, like, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, don't have a great example in mind. I mean, you probably know tools that take like additional data sets that they can work with, but they don't need. Um, and you don't need to connect them, but the required ones you do. So in the workflow editor, if there's something, I have 20 minutes, right? It said 15 to, damn it. All right, well, it's not your fault. I'm sorry, I should have read this. Um, well, a lot of cool things. Um, so the, the next thing is conditional workflow steps. Um, so you may have a step that should run under certain conditions and on certain conditions it should not. Say you have a pre-processing step um, where you take your data and it needs, something needs to happen before. And sometimes you've already done it and sometimes you don't. So you can introduce a conditional and then only uh, run the pre-processing step if either you detect it, it needs to be done or if the user said, do it. Um, Another application is you can sell a separate data. So for instance, you can have a tool step that checks, is the data good enough? And if yes, it runs the main analysis. And if no, it just says, well, here's your data sets that weren't good enough. Um, you can also do more advanced things like you can start with your data set and then you can have a step that says, well, this is a single and paired and this is nanopore. And there are three different uh, set paths in the analysis. Um, and you can then basically use a conditional to say, run this part, run this part, run this part. And even if you start out with like a data set collection that has all of them mixed together, it will just put do them all uh, separately up until this step. And then you can join them back together and get like a unified output. Um, yeah, so how it works is that you toggle on this little 
was in the beginning, you turn on this little thing, the when appears, and you connect the Boolean parameter to it. And that Boolean parameter can be something the user sets or that you calculate in your workflow based on other outputs. Um, then you run it. Um, yeah, it's, it's in principle, like you select your workflow, you run it, you select the data set. Um, there is a Boolean parameter, whether or not you want to skip a step. Um, yeah, much better error reporting. Uh, we have the invocation, we have export. Um, we have a lot of new workflows. Um, the IWC is the top um, yeah, organization on Doc Store. We have the most stars, so um, you can find all those workflows there. Um, and with that, I want to thank the people that like are bringing the workflows to life and, and please join them. Um, especially I want to thank uh, Lucille who did a lot of new workflows for the IWC that are really high quality. Wolfgang who's been pushing it for a long time. Uh, Laila who did a lot, a lot of work um, that I presented. And yeah, really, thank you all. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Nice talk. Um, next up is Ahmed talking about search in Galaxy. Oh, can you hear me? Hi, my name is Ahmed, and I'll be presenting uh, some recent improvements made to search interfaces in Galaxy. So as we know, users often find themselves searching for stuff in Galaxy, such as histories, tools, workflows, and whatnot. And the dev team has been working hard. Sorry. Sorry. All good. So um, yeah, we've been working hard on making uniform search interfaces all across Galaxy because uh, we don't want users to have a learning curve when they move from one search interface to another. This is what a typical search would look like in Galaxy. You would have a search bar and then an advanced menu where you can add to your search. Two recently uh, improved features that I'll be presenting today are the history item search and the improved tool search. The history item search is uh, found on the right side in your history panel where you can obviously use it to find data sets and collections in your current history. Uh, users can either simply search for the, the, with the name of the item they're looking for, or they can add uh, colon identified uh, filters to the query. Better you can use the advanced menu and type your filters in there. Uh, there's a long list of filters. I won't go through all of them, but we've added more and now we have more than we used to in the past. A typical search, for instance, could look something like this. You have, uh, you can type in the name of the data sets and collections that would match the results. And let's say you have a range of indices you want to search. You would just type those in into the menu. A cool feature that we wanted to focus on is the related items filter. So in Galaxy, you often run jobs such as workflows and they can take inputs and then produce outputs. So in that process, you can understand how each data set can be an output from a job and then more data sets or collections could have been created from that uh, nucleus item. So being able to find the inputs and outputs and have them in a nice interface was uh, not something we've had in the past. And so now we have a nice related filter that you can either just type related and the index of the item you're looking for, uh, you wanna see a related item score or you can expand the data set and then just uh, click this sitemap icon and it would show you the inputs and outputs. Uh, you, they're, they're identified by arrows pointing towards the main data set. There are several use cases. Uh, some that come to mind are, for instance, you have a workflow invocation uh, for, in, for a workflow that failed. You uh, expand that, look at the data set and you click this icon and it will show you, uh, give you more context and you can then uh, explore those data sets and see what might have caused it to fail. Or you could uh, also uh, use this filter to create a new history for items that are related to one important data set. 
The next search that I would uh, like to uh, describe is the Galaxy's improved tool search. It can be found on the left-hand side, obviously, and you can uh, search for tools that are uh, installed in the current instance in Galaxy. And this has been around forever, but we needed an improvement in, in the way it worked. In the prior uh, backend implementation, we uh, had a search that wasn't instantaneous and it would still not produce um, uh, properly ordered uh, tools. You would search for a tool and it would show up way down in the list. And uh, we also had results that did not match your query at all. We improved this to a straightforward direct string match. And now you only see results that you searched for and they're ordered better. To further uh, improve your search and add some filters to it, you can expand the menu and then uh, apply some of these filters here. We have a name filter for tools that would match that filter. And then we have a section filter, which is just want to show that it's linked to the current tool panel view. You could have the default view, or you could have multiple other views like uh, EDEM ontologies. And so this field in that menu would be linked to what current view you have. There's also an ID filter that would match the uh, tool XML ID. There is a repository owner filter that would match the tool shed repository owner. And there's a keyword search that you can match uh, words that could be found in a tool's help text. For instance, this is a, what a typical search could look like. You want to search for items that are, are within uh, tools that are within the mapping section that come from the IUC tool shed owner and that match genome and size. Let's say those are some keywords and then you'd see some results for that. A minor cool feature that was fun to implement was the fuzzy search, which means that you could you can now misspell and we show this little did you mean prompt that was fun to implement. So the idea is that the UI team and the backend team, we've been working on implementing uh, not only search interfaces, but other interfaces that serve the same purpose, uniform so that users don't need to learn uh, every view over again, if because it looks so different. And yeah, I'd like to thank everyone who contributed to the code and also everyone who gave encouragement and advice. Thank you. I think we still have time for some questions. Any questions? And Tom. So uh, right now we only have two ontologies there. You were showing EDAM and um, what other one? Um, That's uh, in, so this screenshot is from, um, yeah, the screenshot is from main. I think on all the uh, use Galaxy browsers, we have uh, these three views. Yeah, yeah so uh, how easy it is to create sort of your own custom ontologies. And I think this is something we probably want to uh, get community involved in because this is a good start, but right. there are many different ontologies that you can create. I think so, these we get from bio tools, but yes, we could obviously, this is easy enough to implement, I think. I think it comes from XMLs, but it's uh, it's easy enough to add as many as you want based on each server. But how do you do that? What what's the mechanism? I think that's just a case of requirement. I mean, if we if we can find views that would match Galaxy's uh, tools that are usually installed, like typical tools you would find in most servers, it could be implemented. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Next up, we have Danon talking about modernizing the Galaxy client. Okay, um, this talk is about, you know, sort of our recent efforts uh, modernizing the Galaxy web client. A um, couple of main topics are sort of TypeScript, using these automated, uh, auto-generated API bindings and kind of progress to uh, and what's happening with the migration to Vue 3. Um, I'm Danon, and, but this is the work of the whole uh, UI UX working group. Everyone's contributed. Um, so yeah, we're adopting TypeScript. Um, it's, if you're not familiar, um, TypeScript is just sort of a statically, a statically typed superset of JavaScript. Um, you can define types and interfaces. Uh, tons of people use it. It's the Vue core team uh, writes Vue in it. Um, it's how strict it is, is super configurable, but we're sticking with basically the recommended uh, Vue settings and, and Actually, we're a little bit more strict and we have a couple of tweaks, but it's pretty close. Um, we figured we'll go 
all as strict as we can on the initial implementation instead of trying to like retrofit a bunch of you know fixes into you know half baked TypeScript down the road, right? Um, so it, you build it and lint it with a couple of utilities, um, and it should be pretty familiar to anyone that's used uh, Python's type annotations, right? It's it's kind of the same idea. They're they're optional annotations that are enforced by tooling, and um, you know the bottom line is it's still JavaScript. Um, so it's not like a couple of years ago. Well, it's been a while. Um, at one point, we were con considering uh, adopting CoffeeScript, right? Which is yeah, kind of a, another layer. I'm really glad we didn't at this point, but um, yeah, TypeScript is amazing. It's still JavaScript. Um, and so why are we doing this? Um, so with a statically typed language, you can uh, coordinate changes across a big code base. Galaxies, uh, we just talked about it yesterday, but it, it was something like, it's near a million lines of code, right? Between the front end and back end. And I, I forget exactly how much of that was the front end, but it's not insignificant. Um, so if you change a method somewhere and the return type changes, if that's used in TypeScript, right? If it's a TypeScript return, whatever, um, then you would know immediately that you just broke code in some other part of the application you weren't even thinking about. Um, so it really, it helps coordinate changes in a very large code base. Um, so maintainability, um, if, you're, if you've never seen a, a bunch of code, at least in JavaScript, if it's plain JavaScript, you have no idea what you're looking at most of the time. The objects could be anything. Um, but if they're strongly typed, it's much easier to just sort of jump into something unfamiliar, look at it, and at least know what data you're working with. Um, the tooling is really the big thing, right? So it's all optional typing. It's sort of sugar on top of JavaScript, but uh, the, the tooling that enables code completion, um, inline documentation, we'll see a couple of screenshots of this in a little bit, um, error detection, obviously, uh, and, and some refactoring stuff. And the, the bottom line is just so many bug fixes. When we first adopted TypeScript, and I, you know, I think the very first file I converted from JavaScript to TypeScript, it didn't work because there were bugs. It's like, okay, well, I should start taking account of how many, I really wish I had, um, but it, it's, it finds bugs all the time. Um, so uh, building on that, we now have these uh, auto-generated typed API bindings. Um, because of all the work that the backend team did modernizing the API uh, framework, uh, we now have, we can use, so it's all, that's all fast API. Uh, and it can generate an open, a open API spec of you know, the exact routes, parameters, responses, et cetera, uh, from the API, just one big thing. Um, there's uh, an update procedure built in. You just run make client, uh, up make update client API schema, and it generates this new schema, and it's immediately available for use in the client. Um, this also runs, uh, so if you change the API and you forget to update the schema, and you open a pull request, it gets flagged, and you, you know right away, oops, I need to update that. Um, so it really, it, it outlines the layer between the, the front end and the back end much more clearly. Um, so we use OpenAPI TypeScript to build the schema. And then there's a little OpenAPI TypeScript fetch uh, library that we use to provide a little uh, kind of a fetcher service for, for getting stuff. And I'll show you an example of that in a second. Um, there is a, there's an, I'll skip over that, Never mind. Um, so with these uh, auto-generated typed API bindings, we now have end-to-end -end type safety. So if you know that the API is going to give you, you know, a string, an integer, and a whatever, a Boolean, and that changes, you know that all the way from the server side, all the way to the client side, right? So it's end-to-end -end type safety. Um, so the tooling is really the, the biggest thing. Um, so this is how uh, the example here. Um, so that that's all you have to do to use the fetcher to make. Oh Jesus. <laughs> okay. Moving on along. Um, so, wow. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're, yeah. Um, we're migrating. So it, we've adopted Vue 27 recently um, and we're using the composition API and script setup for everything. Uh, it, it's a lot better. Um, so there's another talk Ali Reza is doing um, on the transition to Pina. Um, it's sort of the spiritual successor to Vuex. I'll let him talk about it. You should listen to his talk. Um, so right now, the current component breakdown, we have 495 view components. We've already uh, converted roughly 150 of them to this sort of script setup composition API. It's really great. Um, everyone loves working with it so far. And 111 are TypeScript. I didn't actually think these numbers were this high. I'm really impressed with how much we've already done. Um, regular JavaScript, we have roughly 550 JavaScript files. Um, I don't know. 
yeah. So we, we've made a lot of progress is all this, this slide. And all of the new stuff is fetch script, composition API components. Um, so why is this in the new feature segment? It's just, it's a massive, whoop, did that just go off? It went off here. It's a huge, uh, I can't see it. Uh, significantly improved developer experience. It just came back on screen. Um, I don't need to read all that. Yeah, so the big, biggest thing, Vue 3 uh, is imminent. So Vue 2 will reach end of life at the end of this year. Um, we were waiting on this for a while because of dependencies. Uh, so specifically Bootstrap Vue is a dependency we use all over the application. Um, it just fairly recently is now compatible with this uh, Vue Compat library, which um, it's kind of a, a bridge point between Vue 2 and 3. Um, there's, we've done a ton with all this modernization stuff. Uh, there's still more to do. Please uh, come to the CoFest because I want to organize people to get make progress on Vue 3. Uh, thank you, and thanks to all the UI UX folks who worked on all this. Um, I don't know. You don't have to ding it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Perfect. Thanks for the talk. Uh, next up is John Davis talking about the data access layer in Galaxy. All right. Um, I'll go into the weeds and under the hood, but I'll do it fast. Uh, this is going to be a very, very fast, uh, very, very brief introduction to how Galaxy interacts with the database. So uh, Galaxy uses a relational database to store data. Uh, data as in not data sets, but data about data sets and data related to all the business logic which supports uh, whatever Galaxy does. The database tables are represented by Python classes and uh, collectively we refer to these Python classes as the Galaxy data model or the model for short. To see what the model is, you can look at the code base, you can look at the class definitions. You can also look at the definition of the database schema using your favorite shell based tool like PSQL if it's Postgres or SQLite 3 for SQLite, or you can use a point and click user interface like a PG Admin 4 or anything else. Uh, you can also take a look at the at, at a graph based uh, representation of the database. It will be very useful if you are looking at a couple of tables or a relationship between two or three or four or five tables. As soon as you move a little beyond that, uh, it's going to be less useful. Uh, the takeaway is that Galaxy's data model is big. It's uh, 160 database tables, though they, those, they, those tables are non-trivial. They have more than 400 explicitly defined relationships between these tables. Uh, and most importantly, it's constantly evolving. We've had approximately 200 migrations uh, and uh, out of those 220, only, only 20 since uh, the 2205 release. So uh, how do you talk to the database in Python? At the very basic level, it's really simple. You just use the Python DB API. You uh, create a connection object, you open the connection, you create a cursor object, you fetch the data into the cursor by, uh, well, first you execute a SQL statement against the cursor, you fetch the data, you close the cursor, you close the connection, you're done. It's very simple. However, it all breaks down uh, because you need a separate implementation for every database we support. We support two databases and that's quite enough because the implementations will be significantly different. It's obviously very tedious and error prone and errors, uh, and you will make errors in this case, uh, they will not be caught by the Python interpreter or any static typing type checking tools. They will happen at runtime. Uh, furthermore, they will happen only in cases when that particular query is going to be triggered by whatever the user is doing on, on the client. And, and, and of course, it's, it's, it's completely uh, and unquestionably unmaintainable. Here is a sample of just one raw SQL query. Uh, we are not going to write this thing manual and we have many, many queries like that, which is why we use a tool. And the tool is called SQL Alchemy. It's uh, a SQL automation toolkit and an object relational mapper. It is the Python data access tool that's been around for a long time, since 2005 and 2006, which makes it as old as Galaxy. Uh, its architecture is very theory based and if anyone really wants to understand how SQL Alchemy works, I would encourage them to take a look at this book before looking at the extensive documentation. SQL Alchemy consists of two main parts, SQL Alchemy Core and SQL Alchemy ORM. SQL Alchemy Core is basically the data definition language, which is Python objects are used to describe the database schema. Uh, SQL Expression Language, which is Python objects used to describe SQL statements. 
uh, in the engine, the engine which connects to the database, maintains a connection pool, translates SQL into database dialects, and most importantly, provides transaction controls. SQL ORM exists on top of SQL Alchemy, SQL Alchemy ORM, exists on top of SQL Alchemy Core, and it maps Python classes to database tables. It manages the state of objects which we have loaded into memory, and it keeps objects in sync with the state of the rows which represent these objects in the database. So essentially, it's yet another abstraction layer. As you know, in computer science, everything can be solved with yet another abstraction layer. Uh, and it adds extra considerable complexity to a code base which is already non-trivial. Why do we need this? Can't we keep it simple? And if you think back two, three decades ago, and uh, in the early days, well, maybe not so early, but in those days of object-oriented programming, when big applications were beginning to talk to relational databases, everything was dirt simple. We would keep all the database access logic in the domain object. So what it means is like, say you have a user object and you need to create it. So you say user equals new user, if it's Java, uh, you load it up with the data. And when you are ready to save it to the database, you say user.save, done. Uh, when you want to retrieve an existing object, you say user repository dot get user by ID. You do whatever you need to do with the user when you are ready. User dot save done. Very simple. Why do we need the uh, the ORM? Again, things break down with more complex logic. When you need to, when you are a galaxy, you need to load, modify, keep track of lots and lots of objects, and and writing them all back to the database using a single write is going to be very slow, very inefficient. Combining them into batch writes is very non-trivial because you need to determine the correct ordering of all these writes because uh, writes might depend on previous writes. You need to lock objects to prevent concurrency issues. You need to make sure you don't lock, you don't load the same object more than once. So SQL Alchemy ORM solves everything. Session maintains list of objects affected by a transaction. It coordinates writes to the database. It does it via a non-trivial topological sort. And it resolves all concurrency issues, which is good. Uh, registry uh, maintains a list of objects mapped to their database identities. And this makes sure that no matter how many times we access a specific row in a database, it will be always represented by the same object in the code. So this is good. And this is how we talk to the database. We use direct use, well, we uh, employ direct use of DB API very sparingly in scripts. And this is a bad thing. We should not be doing that. We use SQL Alchemy Core when performance is critical. In all other cases, we use the ORM. Finally, SQL Alchemy 2.0. I cannot do justice to this. So essentially, it's the biggest change uh, since SQL Alchemy version 0 0.2 or 0 0.3, biggest in 15 years. It adds many, many good things for Galaxy, for Galaxy's code base. It comes at the cost of many, many breaking changes to the core API. So we'll have to rewrite most of our data access code which is okay. The most important thing, it introduces explicit transactional database access, which is the way it should be done, but this is the main challenge. Galaxy pre-SQL Alchemy 2.0, we relied on magic. Uh, magic is good, 10 seconds. <laughs> uh, we did not explicitly begin and then transact database transactions. So read operations had no transactional context, write operations, we we never close the transactions. We just use session flush and it would do things magically for us. So we had basically one big transaction without a beginning, without an explicit end, and SQL Alchemy magically took care of that. Now it's not gonna happen. Database writes must have a commit. If we don't commit, nothing will be saved. If there is an error, nothing will be saved. Reads, even worse, a read automatically creates a transaction. And um, <laughs> I know. <laughs> And the transaction must be closed. If you don't close the transaction, that means database locks. Database locks mean, means idle transactions in the database, connections uh, multiply, Galaxy crashes very fast. Solution is replace one big implicit transaction with many explicit transactions, which is something we are working on. And uh, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, next up, it's Marius again, talking about job caching. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I want to talk to you about the job cache. It's something I, um, I really care about, um, and I'll show you why. Uh, so Galaxy does some really heavy computing storage. Uh, so we currently have 307,667 active users in main. Active meaning they're, they're not deleted. I mean, I didn't check when they last logged in. 
but we have about 36,000 new users per year. We have 24.5 petabytes of data sets, um, which includes also deleted data sets. And you run out of quota, you delete your data sets. But we have five petabytes of non-deleted data sets. We have 51 million jobs. Uh, we have 705,000 workflow runs. And I mean, obviously that's Galaxy's purpose, right? I mean, we do this because we believe we're doing important stuff there. And so this is our grade. But not every job is new and certainly not for tutorials, right? Because that's always going to be the same. Um, one thing, I mean, I mentioned it before, but I really want to drive the point home, like Galaxy captures the provenance um, and the entire analysis chains. Uh, so all two parameters are stored in the database. Uh, we record exactly which input and output data sets have been created and like how they're being used. Um, we know the parameter settings and the inputs and outputs. Um, so we can find jobs that run with the same combination. So tools that produce deterministic outputs, or, you know, put in the same data sets and same parameters and produce the same output. Um, well, if that happens, why, why, why do we run it again? I mean, we don't really need to. Um, so example of tools that produce non-deterministic output where we shouldn't be doing this is tools that query external resources. Like, you know, you want to check your weather, you don't want to check weather from yesterday. Stock prices, same deal, news, well, same deal. Um, or tools that use a random number generator internally, if that is important to you. Um, so, I mean, if you're doing statistic permutations, <laughs> you don't want to cache them, right? Um, then one more thing I want to say is that failure is inevitable. Uh, so the more jobs a workflow has, the more likely it will fail at any given point in time if you assume a constant error rate. So if your workflow produces 10 jobs, every thousandth job will fail. Um, so it's kind of unlikely that your workflow will fail. But if your workflow produces uh, 10,000 jobs, it will probably fail at one point. Um, and I mean, we have mechanisms to deal with it. Um, we've got um, at least some Galaxy instance have set up automatic resubmission. So if something failed and it looks like it's recoverable, it'll try again. Uh, but not everything is recoverable, like errors in external resources, um, your HPC, you know, one node is, is a black node, accepts new jobs, but fails them immediately. Well, that's always going to be a problem. Um, we got a rerun button um, for a long time, uh, but it can take a lot of work to resume jobs, certainly if more than one failed. And it doesn't work for all types of workflows. Um, we could certainly, like, if that happens, we can run part of the workflow again, but that's also tricky because you have to identify which step actually failed, uh, modify the workflow to run just that one part, um, select the relevant inputs, that can also be a lot of work actually. Um, I think the VGP workflows are a great example of <laughs> when that can be a little tricky. Um, and like, you know, if only a fraction of your collection for instance failed, uh, you still gotta run the, the remaining jobs even if you were very careful and like removing the steps that have already run. Um, I wanna say something else. So, you know, developing a pipeline, developing a workflow, I mean, that can be a lot of fun. Uh, so say you're developing a super fancy uh, tool that consumes a lot of related data. So for instance, you do trio variant calling with mother, father, child, and you have like a very specific panel of normals. Maybe that's like the, the intermediate, like the, the um, yeah, I mean, related family, for instance. Yeah. Um, so say that in your pipeline, you have some pre-processing before your actual step that takes time and space. Um, and also that, while you work on this, you work on this, this particular tool uh, of yours that you're developing, and it requires also some downstream analysis to even know how well it worked. Um, so I'm saying we should just be running the moving parts again, right? So you, you update your tool and you update your workflow and then you go, you go again, um, all the way. Um, yeah, so I mean, this is an example of a workflow I did in 2018 when I was still working as a, as a postdoc in a hospital. Um, and the, the red part, I mean, it's more complex. There were workflows upstream and downstream, but like the red part is the thing I was working on and I had to redo that very often and not waste time and space. Um, yeah, so, I mean, another angle to look at this is if you have a pipeline that requires pre-processed data and a QC step should maybe be included, should I include the pre-processing pre and QC in my workflow? Um, like. I would say probably yes, because then I get consistent and complete start to end workflow. You can look at and you know what needs to happen. 
uh, but I may duplicate data sets in ways compute if I already did it. And like, you're always going to do pre-processing QC before you start a real analysis. So it's, mm. and I also want to say like the conditional workflow steps are certainly an option to deal with this. Um, or you say, no, I mean, I want to be efficient. I don't want to waste resources. Um, but then there's no guarantee that, you know, if you hand off the workflow to somebody else, they're putting in the right input data sets. Um, and the workflow is not as easy to run. You can't just look at it and say, oh, it's in this, 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 and this. Um, so again, I mean, we should skip the parts that have already run. Um, there's another angle to it, like for large scale consortia projects. Um, I think currently there are like two types. Um, I want to say there's like the type where you have a large uh, set of data sets that are individually relatively fast to process, like what we did for uh, SARS-CoV-2 variant calling, where we like ran as batches of 100 to 500 data sets. And then it's kind of tricky to find just the one that failed. Um, and then you need to write like an external script to look at like what did actually work and what failed. Um, and another thing that happened in the course of that is that like there were variant caller bugs. We had to change some of the filtering. Um, and so if that happens, we have to run the entire thing again, even though like the variant caller sits somewhere at the end of the analysis and, and the filters even more so. Um, or we have like the other set where we have a modest amount of data sets, but like really large resource requirements like the VGP project or telomere to telomere, um, where for instance, we have an optional export and publish step. So um, that export and publish step consumes a lot of data sets. And the way we've done it is through tags, but it's a, it's a little finicky. It's not ideal. It would be much faster if you said, okay, we're gonna work, run that workflow again, including the export steps um, and like, because we, we're not generating new data, this, this is so much easier. Um, and the same, I mean, the next point, it's not something that has happened yet, but I mean, it's gonna happen. There will be advances in tools and methods. So again, I mean, if like just the last part of your workflow, uh, of your analysis has changed, I mean, it should be easy to just, you know, rerun the steps that changed. Um, so can we run previously uh, run jobs? Yes, uh, Galaxy had a search API since 2014, worked well for finding similar jobs, but not really for finding identical jobs. And that's what we really need if we wanna cache things because similar is not good enough. Uh, so I worked on extending that to data set collections. Um, I figured out a way where we can say, okay, we got this job, take all the outputs and pretend it's a new job and don't even hit the HPC, just take it and copy it. So we could probably do it. Okay, um, we, you know, users can change the name of a data set. So we, can, we shouldn't use what was, you know, um, and, and the name of a data set or the metadata can appear in the job. So we should look at like what was used to produce the output data set. So we're tracking also the history now of the data set so that we can say at this point in time, it looked like that. Um, we need to work, I mean, these are very specific. So I'm gonna skip that. Um, and then I reached the point where we could run the entire SARS-CoV-2 variation workflow um, front to end and have it like be entirely cached. Yes. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, it worked, but it was kind of slow <laughs> on use galaxy.star instance because the query, like it needs to be optimized. And at the time I just didn't do the work. And then, I mean, we, we did the COVID project in a different way. Other priorities came up. It, it existed, but barely anyone knew about it. Um, and then we have these other projects I mentioned that came up and then, then it became uh, interesting again to do this. Uh, it was just a one line change to fix the, the query performance. So in, in March, um, I sat down with John Davis and, and in an afternoon, we, we kind of solved the performance problems. Uh, there were still some provenance problems and like the cache is a really great test to check whether we're really recording everything that's needed to reproduce it. Because if it doesn't, then the new job will go. Um, so you can only, so how does it work? You can only use your own jobs and that's a, a limitation we're just doing <laughs> not to like have surprising results or like you, you had your private data set and suddenly somebody else also has it. So only, you can only search within your own jobs. Uh, input and output data sets must not be deleted um, for the, the, all the job metadata needs to match and upload jobs are currently excluded from the cache. Um, how do I use it? 
Um, if you're in the workflow run form, there's this little uh, gear icon and you can select to uh, say, attempt to reuse job with identical parameters. And then for individual tools, it's also there. For tools, it's not that interesting because like, you might as well copy the output, but for workflows, it, it really makes a difference. Uh, so this is an example of caching an entire uh, workflow from the IWC. That's an attack seek workflow that usually takes about an hour with the data I'm using there. And let's see how the cache works. And this is like, just did this now on usegalaxy.org. Um, you can try this and uh, it, there are some limitations, so it doesn't work on every single thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's it. Um, yeah, so how do I know it worked? Your job turns green immediately. Uh, the quota usage doesn't increase, so we, we don't actually copy the physical data set when we copy things, we just copy the reference. So. Um, that's great. Uh, the data set path is obviously the same as, uh, as from the job that you copied it from. And uh, we're working on an additional indicator uh, to also let the user know that this didn't actually consume anything. Um, so where can we take it from here? So we could enable the job search across all uh, instance users if they consent. Um, we could uh, enable the search for tutorial data only. Uh, we could use data set checksums for the rare cases where uh, we couldn't like determine that the data set is actually the same, but if we have a data set hash, we can say, okay, well, it, it, it is the same. Uh, we can restrict some of the metadata restrictions uh, if we annotate the tools to say they need this or they don't need this. Um, tools and workflows could say that they are always cacheable, even if the metadata doesn't match, or they're never cacheable because you know the random number generator in there is really, really important. Uh, we could uh, start also caching uh, uploads if we do deferred uploads uh, from URIs, so from file sources or from like just general URLs. Um, we could have a job and invocation search preview. So you could say, well, show me just the similar jobs or the similar workflow runs. And like a far off goal could be like you could be searching other Galaxy instances. Um, yeah, that's it. Thanks a lot. Uh, we have a bit of time for questions. Any questions? Yeah. This is important. Uh, more comment types, but uh, uh, next to the URIs. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. So thanks for a very great work. Um, I was uh, had a comment on uh, caching of external URIs. Uh, so I think that depends very much on whether that data might change or not in the future, right? So you need to somehow mark every URI, whether they're cacheable or not. So um, yeah, difficult. or you can like, <laughs> at, at the point in time where you run it, you can say, we fetched it the last time at this point, uh, do you want to use it or not? I mean, it's all very explicit at this point, and like, you have to opt in to use the, the cache. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. And, and like, it's not enabled by default because like, we're still working on it, but yeah, for sure, that's that's a concern. Awesome feature, Marius. Um, for GTN to make it useful for the training, um, I think we need to have that cross accounts, right? Is that planned? Do you plan that to enable that cross account? I mean, it's just a single filter, basically. So the one thing uh, we need to do, like for instance, if a user joined TS, uh, it would be easy to say, well, they are in TS, um, new data while, that was created while they were in TS we could use. I mean, we have to find sort of, um, when they're running a tutorial, that this is tutorial data and that the job cache is okay. Um, or otherwise have a global thing that like, maybe in the user preferences says, I consent to sharing my data and at the same time, um, that means you get to use other people's data. I mean, it's, there's a lot of things we could do, but we also need to think through like, to what degrees are users comfortable with other users taking their work, right? Or there. Thank you. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, next up is Paul talking about our org rate. Yeah. Hello, my name is Paul de Geest. I work as a software developer at Elixir Belgium, and I'll be talking about 
uh, using AuroCrate to uh, export provenance, uh, mostly from workflows in Galaxy. Um, so when we talk about provenance uh, in context of workflows, um, yeah, we have two levels. So either we have the retrospective provenance, which um, yeah, is all the in and outputs of, of a, a specific workflow, um, all the parameters, um, et cetera. Um, and then we have the prospective provenance, which is the recipe or the workflow definition um, in Galaxy. For example, that's the uh, GX uh, format. Uh, so why would we keep provenance? Um, so specifically for workflows, we could think about you could think about uh, comparing workflows. Um, so for example, not only between workflows in Galaxy, but also um, from different workflow systems. Um, so to be able to do this type of uh, comparison, uh, we would need a common format to actually uh, do that. Um, and in some context, we could even think about recreating or rerunning a workflow uh, just based on uh, keeping, yeah, good provenance. Um, so this is where our crate comes in. Our crate is a lightweight packaging format that uh, mainly focuses on, on keeping the data and metadata together. Um, and specifically, it wants to uh, represent all metadata related to um, an experiment, or it could be just a, an object uh, as machine and human readable. And it does that through uh, yeah, keeping, uh, for example, URIs uh, all within a JSON LD uh, format, and it reuses a lot of uh, fair linked standards to do that. Um, so, and lastly, there's also profiles. Profiles kind of um, give extra constraints to specific use cases uh, that you want to um, represent in our crate. Um, so, that is, for example, also helpful for uh, representing workflow runs. Um, so at the most basic level, AuroCrate uh, contains a data set. So, uh, so for example, this example has just one data set and the AuroCrate uh, metadata.json, JSON-LD, um, that is like the main source of uh, information um, of the metadata. And this is kind of how it's being represented. So it describes the, even the top level of the directory and then anything below it and any contextual information such as the author of a, a workflow, for example. Um, and then, yeah, URIs, for example, to, uh, that are related to that context. Um, so when talking about workflow run AuroCrate, we have a set of profiles developed by the AuroCrate community. Um, and these provide yeah, extra constraints for workflow runs um, so yeah, the three levels kind of have increasingly uh, more um, constraints. So the process run create just would be, for example, for a history where you just have a, a set of tools that have been executed, but there's no uh, workflow definition, for example, related to it. Uh, and then the workflow run create needs to have a workflow definition and the provenance run create extends that with intermediary in and outputs of a workflow run. Um, so in terms of Galaxy, we're at the workflow run crate um, level. Um, so here's an example of a workflow. Um, so in the JSON-LD, we represent the prospective and the retrospective provenance. Um, so in this workflow, you can see the GXWF uh, file is uh, the top level of, of the JSON-LD. Um, and then the in and outputs are represented as well as both from the prospective side and the retrospective side. So this is the actual feature in Galaxy. So once you run a workflow, you can go to the workflow run invocation section or the workflow invocation section, and you kind of see how to export that. You could either uh, export it directly or to an FTP location uh, or any kind of remote location. Uh, and then you can start inspecting that. So it's kind of, it's implemented using the AuroCrate Pi library. Um, and yeah, um, so, sorry. Um, 
Yeah, so it's kind of an extension of the standard uh, workflow invocation export that's already in Galaxy, but it extends this with this uh, more readable metadata. Um, and yeah, it's also an, an alternative to the biocompute um, export option for workflow run or workflow invocations. Um, so yeah, its main purpose is to create like this uh, a more readable in, uh, layer on top. So this is an example of a, a workflow run, a, a bit more detailed one. Um, so yeah, this is what this actually would look like for a, a detail or a little bit more detailed workflow. Um, so this was developed through a lot of uh, collaboration and it's been implemented in other workflow management systems. Um, so in terms of benefits of the price, um, added RDM uh, functionalities, um, and it provides ways for, to, for, for example, publish your workflow runs. Um, and so in the future, we want to uh, move to the provenance run crates. So we want to include, for example, the intermediate year steps. Uh, we also want to work with uh, Galaxy histories, and we want to enable import of our crates. Uh, lastly, it's, been, it's available as a training subject uh, on the the training network. Uh, and lastly, I want to yeah, just mention that we have a job opening for a DevOps, Galaxy DevOps uh, at Elixir Belgium. Um, so if anyone's interested, uh, please contact us. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, lastly, I just want to thank everyone who worked on this and the Workflow Run Create community and the Auro Create community and yeah, everyone at Elixir Belgium. Thanks. <laughs> Last talk of the session, uh, we have Ali Reza. Hi, uh, my name is Ali Reza. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Galaxy Freiburg, and I'm really thrilled to be at the GCC. This is uh, this will be my first talk in GCC, and you will see me twice more during the GCC for my other talks. To, uh, this talk is gonna it's about uh, the new multiple history view, instant data gathering across multiple history view. And so in the next, next slide, I will go through the journey of our previous version, the challenges we face, and then uh, will introduce you the new version of the multiple history view. And I will explain you the initial concepts and the process and the features that we uh, bring to the, brings, uh, to the new one to enhance, uh, enhance your Galaxy experience. Uh, at the end, if we have enough time, I will go through a live demo to show you how you can do this thing with the new one. So, so now let's take a journey uh, of the timeline of the multiple story view in Galaxy. It's all began in September 2014 with the first commit that introduced the multiple history view uh, with this commit hash. Uh, we can mark it as a birth date of the multiple history view in Galaxy. And this was the foundation upon which uh, built and uh, evolved the multiple uh, history view over the years. And then in 2017, uh, we bring the Vue.js to Galaxy. Uh, it's a significant milestone uh, from that time. We uh, added the Vue.js with uh, more per, uh, improved performance and uh, most of things to the Galaxy. And then in 2020, uh, we started to rebuilding the history components from that time. And we started to with this uh, pull request in that chapter. And uh, we are starting to using Vue.js to leverage the power features and component-based components. And then uh, in 2022, with this PR, we bring uh, the new multiple story view. We started to bring it to the galaxy. Okay. So uh, now let's take a look at the previous version of the multiple story view. 
as you can see in this screenshot, uh, the interface displayed all the histories uh, from the user at the same time, providing an overview uh, for the available histories. And while the previous version uh, had some useful features, features, it also had some limitations. And we will explore both features and limitations now. So the features, uh, was that uh, you could see, uh, the users could see uh, all, the, all their histories at the same time. They would able to search through the histories. Uh, they could also search all the data sets, eight data sets through the, the, all the histories they have. Uh, they also would able uh, to change current history or create a new fresh history. And they could also drag and drop a data set from a, a history to the current history only. But it also has some limitations that time. It based and relied on the backbone JS, the uh, most popular framework that we had in Galaxy before. And the users uh, couldn't arrange the histories as they uh, want to have. And they also couldn't uh, drag and drop a data set to any history. They, would, they, uh, they could only limit it to drag and drop to the current history. And uh, as the number of history increases, the performance of the multiple history view would decrease, leading to some uh, unresponsive, unresponsive, unresponsibility or potential de delays. So uh, these features uh, were revolutionary that time, but we uh, used these things and we started to resolve the limitations and bring to the new history view. So. Now this is the new uh, version of the multiple story view. We have built up on the strength of the previous version and introduced some uh, several enhancements that significantly improve the user experience when using Galaxy. So uh, during the development phase, we focus on creating a really thanks a user friendly interface that would. <laughs> Uh, same as the workflow managing the navigating. So uh, going faster through that we uh, designed so, uh, some UI that we could uh, implement it on the Galaxy, but at the end we decided to use the, uh, that, uh, the new Galaxy one as you can see here. So the features that new uh, panel has is everything that uh, the old panel had including that. It's completely based on the Vue.js. And uh, now, now, now you can bring unlimited history into Vue without affecting a performance a delay or something like that. And you can also drag and drop any data set to any, all sh any shown histories at the uh, one time. And the, users, uh, the user current selection state would be saved and they can refresh the page, go to uh, another pages and come back then without reselecting. And they could also be able to search, navigate, select, and gather data set across multiples. So I think we don't have enough time to do the live demo. Yeah? 50 seconds. OK. Uh, so I can uh, just encourage you to use galaxy.org to go to use galaxy.org. And you can see the multiple history views. You can play with it, uh, find the box. Or if you have any. Uh, features that you think it's uh, would uh, make it better, just uh, tell us. And at the end, uh, I, would to, I would like to acknowledge the outstanding individuals, uh, including Lila and Sam, for their uh, commitment and contribution to building this thing, and also UI UX working group. And OK, that's my talk. Thank you. Thanks a bunch. Thank you. <laughs> I think and that concludes our session.